This is Matthew Cratter from Trady University, and today I want to talk about how Bitcoin mining helps the electric grid. This is part of the series that I've been doing over the past week, and it's part of the series about why Bitcoin mining is actually good for the environment. This is a little bit of a counterintuitive point, but I talk about it in this video from a couple days ago, which I'll link in the description notes below. In that video, I talked about how Bitcoin mining provides free market incentives to use wasted or stranded energy sources like methane from landfills, for example, or flared or vented natural gas. And there's some companies, very interesting companies doing stuff like this. Vespine Energy is using landfill methane to fuel Bitcoin mining. And we have the Great American Mining Company that uses flared or stranded gas, natural gas, to power Bitcoin miners. So I'll link to all of that in the description notes below. But what I want to talk about today is specifically the electric grid and Bitcoin mining. Now, this is a very, very deep rabbit hole that I've only begun to go down. So what you're going to see here is a fairly simplified version of it. There's a more complex version, but I think that this is still a good representation of what Bitcoin mining has to contribute to the electric grid. So the first thing to know about electric grids in general or power grids is they need to be designed for peak demand not average daily usage. You can't have the grid go down just because it got really hot outside, as it is in many places in the US and Europe, as I'm recording this, and just because it got hot outside and everyone came home from work and turned on their air conditioners and washing machines. So you have to build the grid for peak demand, not average daily usage. This is a very basic fact that socialist countries like California are still trying to figure out whenever the heat goes on, they have potential blackouts and they're not they haven't done a very good job of building nuclear plants and building a really robust grid infrastructure. California is rapidly becoming a fairly third world place unfortunately. So this is not the grid not going down. This isn't just about convenience. When the electric grid goes down, people actually die. Productivity plummets as well. If you can't use a computer, if you can't use the internet, if you can't use your cell phone and communication channels, this is what the whole modern economy is based on. Not to mention the fact that if you can't if you can't cool your home when it's 120 degrees outside, if you have young children or babies or elderly people, you're really putting their health at risk. And not every building, not every hospital, not every essential service can have its own backup generator. Backup generators are obviously a fairly dirty and loud way to generate electricity. It's much better to have a modern grid. And it's not really fair to say that people just need to be flexible and learn to live without their heating and air conditioning. If we want to have a modern civilization, it's really nice, for example, neonatal ICUs that they can function without the electricity going out. And we've seen over the years, I don't want to pick on Texas because they actually do a much better job. Uh, ERCOT does a really good job with the Texas power grid, but we saw this example from January of 2022, where a lot of Texans died from the power going out and they did not have sufficient heating or electricity. If you're finding this video helpful so far, I just ask you to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, maybe share this video with a few friends, especially friends who are very worried about Bitcoin's energy usage. So grid, electric grid 101, you need to overbuild the grid. This means that in order to be able to handle peak demand spikes, the electric grid needs to be overbuilt. And most of the time you're going to be running it and not using all of the power or all of the potential power that can be generated. The, the problem is it takes time to power up a nuclear power plant, for example. It even takes time to power up what you call a peaking power plant, which are normally natural gas. And you, you rev these up when you have a lot of electricity demand and you need uh, for peak demand to generate some extra electricity. But all these things take time and sometimes you don't have the time to respond. So electric grid operators have this basic job and it's a very difficult job of trying to match the supply of power generation with the demand for that power. And the introduction of renewables into the grid, and I do put that in quotation marks because renewables are not quite as clean and renewable as people 
think they are, you need to dig up all the materials from mines, usually in third world countries. You have to dispose of all the old stuff, not all of, not all of the wind turbines and solar panels can be completely recycled. So they have their own trade-offs and their own dirtiness, but we'll call them renewables because that's what people refer to them as. But matching, when you introduce renewables to the electric grid, renewables like wind, solar, hydro, it makes it even more difficult to match power supply with demand and it makes grid operators jobs a lot more difficult. The real problem with renewables is that lots of time these power sources will be generating power just when you don't need it. So for example, the wind blowing at night in West Texas or Wyoming, when no one needs the electricity that would be generated by wind, wind turbines in the middle of the night. Also, lots of times these power sources will not be able to generate power when you need it most. So for example, say it's very cold outside, but the wind is not blowing and there's a huge cloud cover, so the sun is not shining. So you have to bow, you have to balance supply and demand. And because the supply of renewables is fairly inter intermittent in most places in the world, and there are places like Europe, which doesn't have a whole lot of sunlight and doesn't have a whole lot of wind, it makes it even more difficult. The other problem, of course, is that battery technology is still in its infancy. It's still very limited. And so you cannot store the excess electricity as well as you theoretically could. Battery technology is still fairly primitive. And for this reason, power really does need to be produced when it's needed at the same time that it's needed and fairly close to where it's being used. You can't just store it in a battery and you can't send it a great distance because if you try to send electricity over long distances, even if you do it using high voltage power lines, you end up losing a lot of it. And the estimates that I've seen estimate that something like five to 10% of global electricity gets wasted just in transmission. So what's the solution to this? As you can imagine, the solution involves Bitcoin mining. So this is what you do. You build the grid for peak demand spikes, which means you overbuild it, or in other words, the grid will be overbuilt for most daily situations, but it will be able to handle peak demand when it's August and it's 120 degrees outside and there's all this demand for electricity. So you overbuild the grid and then you allow Bitcoin miners to use excess electricity during normal times. The grid has been overbuilt, so most of the time you're going to have this excess electricity being produced. It's not very simple to power down a nuclear power plant. For example, solar and wind and hydro may even be producing electricity, as we said, when you don't need it. And then when demand spikes, when you have these spike events, you tell all the Bitcoin miners to turn off their mining machines, or at least to scale them back. And the way you incentivize this is by entering in, into cheap power agreements with Bitcoin miners. You basically give them really cheap electricity most of the time, and you put this into their forward power agreements. And then in exchange, they agree to turn off when the grid gets into trouble, when it's late afternoon and it's 100 degrees outside and everyone needs to use their air conditioning and Bitcoin mining, at least in that area, can temporarily be put on pause. Now, there's no other industry like this that can quickly power down and power back on. You can't do this with server farms or data centers. You can't do this with factories. You can't do it with a steel plant or a cement plant on a moment's notice. These are fairly slow to turn on and to turn off. And things like data centers or server farms, you really can't turn them off or you, you get into a lot of trouble. So the Bitcoin mining industry allows us to overbuild a power grid, use the excess electricity for Bitcoin mining when it's not needed by the general ecosystem, and then scale back that Bitcoin mining from its peak and even turn it off completely if you need to. But there's even more that Bitcoin mining can do. In the US at least, power grids need to be kept at what's called the system frequency, which is 60 Hertz in the US. And when you have power supply and demand and when they're mismatched, this can affect this baseload frequency. And having lots of renewable power sources on the grid makes this job even more difficult. It's much easier to do with hydrocarbons, with fossil fuels, or with nuclear fuel sources because they're not intermittent in the same way that renewables are. So when you have power supply constantly changing, especially because of renewables, and when you have power demand constantly changing, it can affect and make the system move away temporarily from this baseload system frequency. And what Bitcoin miners can do is they can turn on or off at the direction of the grid operator in order to keep the, help to keep the system frequency, this should say frequency, 
at 60 hertz. And so in this way, Bitcoin mining can be used to fine tune the frequency and keep it at 60 hertz. So if it's trading at 59 hertz, Bitcoin miners come on, drive it back up and vice, and vice versa. I will link to an article here that talks more about frequency response and how it works. It's a fairly technical article, but it's it's pretty interesting to read. I want to end with a really nice bonus, and that's the really obvious fact that people nevertheless forget, which is that Bitcoin miners and the Bitcoin mining industry is extremely mobile. It can be deployed where it's needed and then moved later. So for example, all those Bitcoin miners, they moved from China and came to Texas. They can be used in Texas now to help jumpstart the renewable industry there. And then if they're needed somewhere else, they can easily be moved. You can't move your gold mine. You can't move your cement factory. It's very difficult and expensive to move a server farm. So now that you know all of this and you have this better concept of how Bitcoin is good for the environment, how Bitcoin helps to stabilize the electric grid, this will give you the ammunition to laugh even harder at Ethereum moving away from proof of work and having Ethereum miners and moving to this really captured controlled system of proof of stake because it uses elect less electricity and because it's quote unquote good for the environment. Ethereans, including Vitalik himself, don't seem to understand how the energy industry works. And they don't really care because they're moving toward this much more controlled system where the validators are large exchanges like Coinbase and Kraken, as, as I've talked about in other videos, who will be validating blocks and voting on blocks in the new proof of stake system. And they will be very subject to regulatory capture. So this is the great irony, Ethereum moving away from proof of work in order to virtue signal when in fact, I think the insiders are actually smarter than this. They're doing it just to increase their control. And under proof of stake, the more coins you own, the more control you have over the protocol. Under proof of work and with Bitcoin mining, the miners have no control over the protocol. They're basically the factories that have to do the job and build the blocks. And then the full nodes validate the blocks and make sure that they're following the consensus rules. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.